Welcome to the Deep Waters Podcast. We pray that Christ is at the beginning, the middle, and end of all we do. May openness and shalom mark our discussion. As we engage in conversations about the fresh move of God, may our hearts be drawn to unity. And in all things, may this shape us to look more like you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now grab your favorite mug, fill it with your favorite beverage, and yes. settle in for the Deep Waters podcast. Clink, 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 clink. clink. Hey, Jace. Hello. Uh, what do you want to talk about today? Um, I was thinking of the book of Nehemiah in its entirety. Should we just read it? Yes, but right. in Hebrew. Oh, I'm glad I've been practicing. Yes. <laughs> um, so buckle up, everyone. Get um, your Hebrew ears on. First, it's important for me to tell you that Nehemiah in Hebrew is pronounced Nehemiah. Really? Isn't that great? That is great. I feel like I've heard you say that just in random. Really? Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> and yeah, you yeah. know, like when you're an eighth grader in your public junior high school yeah. and you have to take a Spanish class and you all pick Spanish names. Yes. Mine was Sancho <laughs> <laughs> because Benjamin is not at all Spanish. That's incredible. It was funny because we did the same thing in Hebrew, but Benjamin is already a Hebrew name. Yeah. But I wanted to pick a different one. And mm-hmm. so I chose Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Yeah. I thought that was cool. That is great. That is so good. Um, um, alas... We're not talking about Nehemiah. No, everybody was probably so eager for that conversation. Now, well, I guess we'll we'll put that on the back burner and save it for another time. Yeah, because I can feel the eagerness just here right now, just of you, Bo, in the gym, (laughs) just wishing that we were talking about Nehemiah. Bo in the gym. Yeah, I know. (laughs) He told me that's that's when he listens to the pod. Yes. Yeah. So we bless your workout in Jesus' name. Yes. 100%. And we're going to follow up on the previous two conversations because we've had a handful of feedback from different listeners with some follow-up questions. Yeah. And we're not going to claim that we have clean answers Mm -hmm. right now. Quick disclaimer. Um, in case that wasn't already obvious from the past two, (laughs) but we're just going to hammer in a little bit more and then take the conversation a different direction, um, to settle it in in that kind of heart of first Corinthians 13, which we started last podcast with. Yeah. I think we started with it. Didn't we? uh, Yes. At some point it came up in the podcast, but yeah, last, so two weeks ago we talked about, um, the Holy spirit baptism. Right. And it was really beautiful and brought up a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of questions about tongues. And so then we did a podcast on tongues with your two resident experts on tongues. <laughs> um, I'm anything but that. Yeah. In parentheses, lots of sarcasm. <laughs> yeah, um, there you go. <laughs> but it was just really good to wrestle with different ideas and kind of not land in a succinct place and be okay with different interpretations. And we can yeah. still worship with one another. And that's incredibly beautiful. And I think we want to take that same spirit as those two podcasts into this to maybe flush out a few more things about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but then also, you know, where does this land even in the discipleship of the Christian in priority? That's good. Is that how you'd say that? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. So now that I've repeated pretty much what Benjamin said at the beginning. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm trying to find another document that I think will be helpful for us, but I might not be able to. The Bill of Rights? It's, yeah. (laughs) How do you do that? That's <laughs> so fast. Uh, um, well, the declaration of lefts. Yeah, exactly. Shoot. No, I'm not going to be able to find it. Am I? Please, Lord. Anyway, I'll keep looking later. Okay. Um, it's a testimony of somebody whose name I'm forgetting right now when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Oh, wow. It was so cool. I was hoping to read it. Maybe I'll just reference it and we can put it in the show notes. Was it in your notes last time? Yeah. Oh, so it was in the show notes? From uh, that might, episode? It might have been, but I can also just look up your notes from last time. Oh, too. that'd be great. Okay, do that while I launch us, if that's okay. okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, we had a listener, our wonderful, wonderful listener friend, 
Molly. Am I allowed to call her by name? Totally. Okay. If you don't want us to call you by name in the future, just let us know. <laughs> <laughs> um, asking some really profound questions like, how does it feel when you're speaking in tongues? She had heard from somebody else in our congregation that when that person's speaking in tongues, they can like actually in some visceral way feel the Holy Spirit edifying their inner man. Um, which to her sounds great, but also mm -hmm. she hasn't experienced that. So she's like, is there a universal way that speaking tongues is supposed to feel? And um, like, if so, what is it so that I know whether I'm speaking in tongues or not? Yeah. Uh, Cause I just kind of want clarity. And I, I personally relate to that in my testimony of like, man, I would just like to know Lord, if I'm just leaning into this kind of trying to force it, um, but it's not really a gift that you've handed me. It's um, something that I'm trying to manufacture in which case I don't want it because I'm not trying to manufacture anything. But if I'm walking into it in faith and you bestow it upon me by that action, then I want to lean in and press further into it. Yes. Um, so you'll notice that in this question, I think there's a big divergence that will happen. We can wrestle in more than just two camps, but if we can paint with broad strokes, the two camps here are those who believe that the gift of tongues is for everyone and those who do not. And um, typically, I think that gift of tongues is for everyone camp will say that you've been baptized in the Holy spirit, then you've received the gift of tongues. So just operate in it by mm -hmm. faith and the Holy spirit honors your babbling, you know? Yeah. And I even heard, um, Michael Miller from upper room say in a great sermon on tongues that, um, he thought of when he was first learning tongues in the same way that like little children learn any language. Yeah. You've been a father. You are a father. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What is it like when your kid very start, like just begins the process of learning language? Is it really succinct and clear and articulate? Oh, uh, well, no, not at all. It's like a lot of repetition and say, say this, like, can you say, Dad, da, and it starts with like, yeah, you know, <laughs> and then it's like dad, da, and now it's like daddy, and it's like really clear, and like there's, a, but oh. it takes a year for that to happen. Whoa, you know? and that's a year of consistent practice. Yeah, for sure. And also, I don't know if this is Zakai's story, but when I've been around my like nieces or whoever, I feel like often they say. They're trying to say 15 different things, but in my ear, those all sound like the same exact word. Yeah. I just hear like, ma. Yeah. And I'm like, was that mama? And they're like, oh no, she was asking for water. Yeah. I'm like, how totally. did, <laughs> yeah. how did you know that? Mm -hmm. And the parents just know. Yeah. Oh, very much so. That's, that's very common. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we can use that as a metaphor to like, understand the way that we interact with tongues, then it makes sense that when we first start interacting with tongues, we're going to sound really baby-ish. Mm -hmm. There might even only be like a handful of sounds that we repeat over and over and over again. Yeah. Leaning into those sounds and then allowing the Holy Spirit to sort of um, mature the complexity of that language in time mm -hmm. by faith. Yeah. Uh, what do you say to that, Jace? I've, um, I've heard a handful of yeah. people say that and yeah, I think it's a cool take. I think it is a cool, cool take. I don't feel like I have any like way to refute that to say that it's wrong necessarily. I think that's maybe even closer to my own experience in hmm. where it's just, it's felt, it's felt like something that has been practiced in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and not just like this switch that I turn on that I have just in this like endless flow of this heavenly language. Wow. You know, yeah. that, it, that, that there's still this, this partnering and surrendering to the Lord and being vulnerable. I don't know. That's good. I'm thinking Those of Pastor Surprise from A Voice in the Night. Um, excellent book. If you haven't read it, by the way, go read it. A Voice in the Night by Pastor Surprise. Um, 
Sitole. I don't know how you pronounce his last name. Um, But anyway, amazing. He was given multiple languages by the Lord. Um, He's still with us doing ministry in Mozambique, I think. Wonderful man of God. Uh, And he describes one testimony where he sits down in an interview for a Bible school that the Lord told him to go and apply for and go to. Mm -hmm. He's from Mozambique. The language there is Portuguese, um, but he also speaks a handful of tribal languages. Um, He goes to South Africa to this Bible school and conducts the interview. Uh, If you don't know, the predominant language in South Africa is English not Portuguese. He doesn't know English, but he goes, the Lord told him to, he conducts this interview. At the end of the interview, the guy interviewing him said, where did you learn English? And surprise goes, I I still haven't learned English. (laughs) And the guy's like, you've been speaking perfect English this whole interview. Whoa. And Pastor Surprise realizes that God gave him English in that interview. And he, he'd been speaking it the whole time and didn't even know. Whoa. He, cause he, he, in his head, he was speaking Portuguese. That's crazy. Is that not wild? That is so cool. And then, and this is what I love. Um, and why I wanted to bring it up. He then says, though the Lord gave me the language, I still had to learn it academically. It wasn't like the matrix where just the entire English grammar was downloaded into my brain in a moment. N- no, it was like he supernaturally equipped me to speak it. And to have maybe a leg up in that journey. Mm -hmm. But I still had to like understand and learn the grammar of the language, memorize vocabulary. Um, So there was kind of like a a divine gifting and a partnership of his learning and work Mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. Um, So he said he still had to continue his learning of English after that. Um, But God had somehow supernaturally equipped him with it in advance. Um. So I wonder if we could view spiritual like angelic tongues with a similar light. Yeah. Like I've been equipped with it, but I'm not speaking in some kind of elite academic way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like have to grow yeah. from infancy into maturity in that language or in that gifting. I mean, you can map like that's the same map that all of discipleship to Jesus is. that's good you know like with anything Mm -hmm. um with interpersonal skills with um healing of our hearts and sanctifying our sin natures you know it's like all that is yes there's been this like breakthrough and we have been become new creations Mm. but breakthrough is just the beginning in that sense. love that and not not the end piece Wow, the breakthrough is not the finish line. Yeah, the I haven't arrived. The, yeah, you haven't arrived at breakthrough. Breakthrough I, is. Think of like breaking through a, a city wall or something if you're going to take the city. That's good. You know, which, you know, a little violent. But like you break through, if you stop yeah. there, I mean, they you don't get the city. Like they'll just overrun you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like the walls of Jericho fall and the Hebrews just, yay, and yeah. then they call it a day. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. They stormed the city. Yeah. Yeah. Which again, violent. Yeah. Is that where the word breakthrough comes from? Do you think? I don't know. I've always just thought of that analogy with breakthrough because I feel like every breakthrough in my life has then taken work to mm. fully Dang. come to maturity. That's see, uh, that's not what I want to hear in my flesh yeah, I know. because it's not microwave spirituality. It's mm-hmm. crockpot spirituality, you know, like <laughs> I got to lean into it. Yeah. I got to practice it. Um, It's going to take time. This Mm -hmm. is a slow burn. This is delayed gratification. This is not instantaneous Mm -hmm. stuff. And I think all too regularly, we in the church expect the way of Jesus to be a series of instantaneous blessings from heaven. Yeah. um, Where we just get upgraded. God has promised us the path of discipleship that will be matured into the likeness of Christ into the, his divine nature. Second Peter chapter one, we're going to read yeah. it later. Um, but that isn't something that just happens yeah. in a moment, though a lot can happen in a moment for a lot of people by mm-hmm. the grace of God, even for the most r- radical 
examples of that when people were healed of all their addictions and mental illness fell away and physical illness fell away. There was still after that a journey of consecration and discipleship yeah. and sanctification. Wouldn't mm-hmm. you say in yes. every case? I, I think so in every case. Mm. I think we're given so much, we're given eternal life, but through death. Like it's not this like wow. easy, quick thing. It's like, it takes this like repeated throughout the New Testament, a dying to self constantly, wow. a, a crucifying ourselves, which is this like constant act and not just like the one time thing. That's good. Okay. This is good. I, I want to, if it's okay, flip the other yeah. side of the coin yeah. a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, because a lot of people, when they talk about tongues are less talking just overtly from scripture, because we don't really have all that much in scripture about tongues. And they're talking more from experience of their own testimonies of the people around them. And so I assume that those who have received the gift of tongues especially in like a really radical supernatural way when they were baptized in the Holy spirit, assume that everybody is going to have that same Mm -hmm. experience. It's easy to project your experience with God on the church. I think also if that was your experience, you would even desire it for people Mm. in the church with a pure heart, with a pure heart. Amen. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. That's good. Yeah, that's not any kind of malicious or presumptuous thing. You're totally. right. No, it's like out of this pure heart of like, wow, look what the Lord did for me. I want him to do that for you. Wow. But then we start to create doctrine around that. That's good. And that's where it gets messy because we're just yeah. trying to clarify things that maybe there isn't clarification on. Wow, that's good. Or we don't have that kind of certainty. Because the messy thing is same people with very different testimonies could be doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. They were baptized in the Holy spirit, didn't receive the gift of tongues. Years later, the Lord gave them some supernatural impartation of the gift of tongues. Mm -hmm. I think the former person would say you had the gift the whole time. The latter person would say that actually wasn't my experience. I tried to operate in the gift, but I never had it. And then it happened. Yeah. And then maybe the former person would say, well, when it happened, that's when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's, yeah. you know, it's kind of like he, sh- he said, she said mm-hmm. um, with our testimonies. And so I just want to like allow space for that mess mm-hmm. um, for us to do our best to interpret scripture as honestly and thoughtfully as possible. First Corinthians 12 and 14. We talked about this a lot last episode, so yeah. I'm not going to go too in depth mm-hmm. there. Um, but say if, if your stance is that speaking in tongues is not for everyone, then it is good according to scripture to earnestly desire the gifts though. Notice in first Corinthians 14, Paul says to earnestly desire the greater gifts. And he explicitly labels prophecy as a greater gift because it's a corporate, um, edification. Mm Mm-hmm. Whereas tongues is an individual edification. And that's not to say that you can't be edified in your spirit in other ways than tongues. So if a person says, well, I want to be edified in my spirit and I haven't received tongues, how is that fair? Yeah. Remember that discipleship is more holistic than that. Tongues Mm -hmm. is not the only path to Christ-likeness. Yeah. I think that we need to get rid of the the idea of maybe um, a deeper relationship with God if you speak with tongues instead of like... move away from that language and it's like a different relationship, Mm. you know, it's just a different side of connection, a different intimacy. It's not a deeper intimacy. Mm. I feel like that needs to be said. Yeah. Um, Yeah. In a conversation we were having with our wonderful Molly yesterday, it came to my mind to mention the deepest intimacy I've experienced with the Lord has been in my greatest grief and suffering. Mm. And I don't like go around praying despair on people around me so that they can encounter the intimacy of the cross in their visceral life, you know, Mm -hmm. because it was, it was miserable, simultaneously miserable and completely glorious because of the nearness of God. Wow. Um, that's beautiful. But also like, I don't want to just quantify intimacy with God. Yeah. We all have different experiences. Exactly. And maybe for someone, they, experienced a greater depth of intimacy 
as far as their testimony is concerned, when they received the gift of tongues. And I praise the Lord for that. Mm -hmm. And other people are experiencing way greater depths of intimacy as they study scripture intently. So lean in. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to uh, oversimplify the spiritual walk, reducing it to only the gifts of the Holy Spirit are the way that we measure our maturity in the Lord. Yeah. Um, I think that can be really dangerous and lead to a lot of comparison and insecurity amongst us. Absolutely. And I would say to your point, it's kind of unbiblical when it talks about what maturity looks like Hmm. in scripture. It doesn't necessarily quantify spiritual gifts with maturity as it must other, you know, uh, measures of character and the fruits of the spirit. That's good. Do you want to get into that or is it not? Sounds fun. Yeah. I mean, I actually had a couple other questions. Okay. So okay, if we get to that in a second, Mm -hmm. I also would be remiss if I said to earnestly seek the gift of tongues without saying earnestly seek the gift of interpretation, because Mm -hmm. that's very clear. Yeah. We said that last episode, but I just want to say that again. Um, Because our culture, church culture in general, doesn't do a good job seeking interpretation Mm -hmm. of tongues. Um, But I want to personally do a better job praying for that myself. Um, okay. I didn't really answer a lot of these questions, but I think that was helpful. No. Um, did you ever find that testimony that I was trying to search for? Yeah. There's a testimony of a gentleman whose name I don't remember who was like in his study praying and he receives what he... Is it R.A. Torre? Torre? Maybe. Do you... I tried to send it to you, but it wouldn't go. Oh. Or Duncan Campbell. Let's see here. Yeah. There was a really quiet impression he had from the Lord. He said, like, it's irresponsible for me to continue going on preaching without having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I found it. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, please. I think it is the R.A. Tory. Yeah, I have no idea who this is, by the way. So do your own research. (laughs) But I found this testimony and it blessed me a lot. (laughs) I had been a minister for some years before I came to the place where I saw that I had no right to preach until I was definitely baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then just as far as I could, I shut myself up alone in my study and spent some time continually on my knees asking for God to baptize me with the Holy Spirit. I recall the exact spot where I was kneeling in prayer in my study. It was a very quiet moment, one of the most quiet moments I ever knew. Then God simply said to me, not in any audible voice, but in my heart, it's yours, now go and preach. (laughs) <laughs> Sometime after this experience, I do not recall just how long after, with sitting in my room one day, that very same room, suddenly as near as I could describe it, though as, though it does not exactly describe it, I was struck from my chair onto the floor and found myself shouting. I was not brought up to shout, and I am not of the shouting temperament, <laughs> but I should, but I shouted like the loudest shouting Methodist. <laughs> glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, and I could not stop. I tried to stop, but it was just as if some other power than my own was moving my jaws. At last, when I had succeeded in pulling myself together, I went downstairs and told my wife what had just happened. But that was not when I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I was baptized with the Holy Spirit when I took him by faith in the naked word of God. Whoa. Thank you. I felt the spirit really strongly as you read that testimony. It's, it's a really beautiful testimony. Uh, what I what I love about this and find so helpful is that he deconstructs a little bit the like formulaic predictability that mm-hmm. some people resort to when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He was baptized, he said, in maybe one of the most quiet moments of his whole life. Yeah. There was nothing extraordinary or unusual about it. The Lord just spoke to him in a quiet whisper in his heart. It's yours. Hmm. Go and preach. That's beautiful. And then what did he say? Like a week later or something? He has that sometime later. Incredible experience where his body's overcome and he just starts screaming glory to God. And notice even still tongues is not involved. Um, So I I just want to hold this intention and say that view that um, tongues necessarily does come with the Holy Spirit baptism could still stand in light of that. And he just didn't operate in it yet. Yeah. Um, it's hard for me to not lean on my bias because that's not my view. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I think this is a really good example of how the Holy Spirit can come and the gift of tongues cannot be given in that moment. Um, but other gifts are, mm-hmm. and that's okay. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that he shouldn't seek the gift of tongues, but if he seeks the gift of tongues his whole life and the Lord never gives it to him, his heart should be content in that. I think, Mm -hmm. um, because God, God is good and I trust him to give good gifts when we're ready for them Mm -hmm. and to withhold gifts, um, if he has reason to, Mm -hmm. but again, just, yeah. I'm just trying to say all the things on both sides so that we can make it really messy. And hopefully within <laughs> that, you listener can yeah. discern where do you stand in this conversation? And again, as we said last week, this is not a divisive issue among us. We can worship alongside one another and celebrate each other's testimonies without, um, without feeling the need to force mm-hmm. the issue to be agreed upon. Yes. That's good. Is that fair? That's so good. Um, very fair. Yeah. Okay. I think we hit most of what I wanted to hit there. Thank you for that. Um, let's go into this conversation around individuality and the collective. more nuggets of wisdom that came out of the terrific Molly um, were if I'm earnestly seeking the gifts of God um, could it be possible for me to find myself in some kind of independence where I'm seeking because I want to be the fulfillment of prophecy and healing and tongues and so on and so forth Mm -hmm. in my own midst. (laughs) I want to be the one-stop shop for church. Um, and is that, um, and I think you can earnestly seek the gifts without this individuality, Mm -hmm. but what we want to do is potentially expose any individuality where it might remain and say, um, God created us as diverse and unique And in one of the primary chapters about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 uses the metaphor about the body of Christ in order to accentuate the diversity of us and how we need one another in our diversity because who we are collectively is the body of Christ, not who I am individually is the body of Christ. Mm Mm-hmm. And if we're not seeing the gifts through that lens, we're missing it. That's so good. I think this is a really important thing to point out because I think it's going to take a long unworking of just the cultural soup that we're brought Mm -hmm. up in of um, just rampant individualism. Wow. You know, and the, uh, so much of the way um, the new Testament is written we read in an, from an individualistic lens even though it is written to a community um in a communal lens and so i think this is even if you feel like your heart is just desiring all these gifts just to know more of god which is beautiful i think it's just it's so can so quickly individualism our cultural individualism so quickly latch on to that yeah. Um, and I think it's just something to be aware of. That's I think good. it's, I think it's a, um, foothold for the enemy to use. Wow. Say that. So I think that's, that's the need for even just awareness of this is like, it's, that's a slowly, um, I think lies can be brought into, um, those desires of like, you don't need them or you need what they have or wow, they are more intimate than you because of this. And just like comparison creeps in, Mm -hmm. um, isolation creeps in and those are not of the kingdom of God whatsoever. Amen. Amen. Molly brought up the parable of the talents that Jesus shares multiple times throughout the gospels, uh, that there are three servants Jesus describes and they're given different amounts of cash. 
they're not all given the same amount of cash. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's helpful right there that Jesus in this parable on stewardship shows us one was given a handful, one was given a bunch of handfuls, and one was given a wheelbarrow full yeah. of cash. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, w- the amount that you were given really didn't matter. Yeah, What did matter was how much did those servants steward what was given. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to miss that in this conversation. Say you're really praying, earnestly seeking for one of the spiritual gifts that you don't have. Um, allow this to be a moment where you just consider what spiritual gift do you have and how are you stewarding it? Mm -hmm. Because the church needs it. God gave it to you on purpose. Wow. So you have the gift of faith. Mm -hmm. We were talking about this yesterday. Say you have the gift of faith and there are a handful of people in your community that are struggling for some reason to hold on to faith because Mm -hmm. life every now and again, in case you haven't lived that long yet, you don't know. Every now and again, life is terrible Yeah, and you need faith. And some people have a better job just triumphing through the day in faith than others. Um, That gift is needed Mm -hmm. in the church. Healing, administration, help, you know? Yeah. Healing, prophecy. Did I say healing twice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Healing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All of it. Yeah. All of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I would encourage you... Not to stop earnestly seeking, of course, because that's a command that Paul gives us, but it's not the highest command. Mm -hmm. The more high command is love the Lord with your whole self and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you earnestly seeking the gifts is getting in the way of you loving your neighbor as yourself because you're just so focused on yourself and you're comparing yourself with your neighbor and that's that's bubbling up in resentment in your heart. Wow. Then stop it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> stop that right now. <laughs> uh, do, you the, want, do you want to read this this banger of a line? Mm, yeah, this so was straight from this for a little bit. the poetic Molly. <laughs> if one person in the community has the gift, we all have the gift. Oh, box breaker alert. Yeah, I'm. I was thinking whether this applies to tongues. Hmm. If it. If we're talking about tongues and interpretation, then yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't really need that many interpreters if we're always going to gather in the same group. Mm -hmm. We just need somebody with the gift of interpretation to do the job. Yeah. But as far as I'm aware, like, I don't know anybody in our church that's operated in the gift of interpretation, like on a Sunday or something. Mm -hmm. Um, But notice, like, if that person has that gift and they're in community with me, then I have that gift through them. Yeah. We're one body. Mm-hmm. Uh, prophecy. There are incredible prophets in our midst that I get to hang around and reap the benefits of edification through the incredible words of prophecy through them. Yeah. Even if the prophet prophetic words are not directed toward me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we need to start to see ourselves as a church, the image of God, um, as a collective concept, not Mm -hmm. as an individual. And that, that line helped me. If one person in the community has the gift, then we all have the gift. Don't think, oh, because that person has it, I need it. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe you need that person. Yeah. Come on. And God's trying to encourage you into relationship with that person. Wow, that's so good. And if you're like, no, 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 because that person kind of offends me and we think really differently about eschatology or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, well, then lean in even harder because that's yeah. probably exactly why God knows that you need that person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, this this is the, I feel like the kingpin to um, dismantling individualism. Hmm. Um. I think that I think this is so beautiful on all fronts. Like anything promised to the body of Christ is something promised to us, but not for just us, but for everyone and something promised to us individually um, in relationship with the Lord is also, you know, it's like, there's just like this. Yeah. I'm, I don't know. Communal is like the, the word I'm trying to get away from. Cause we've already said it a bunch of times, but collective, glory in the bride of Christ well, that we don't view often. And I love that whole idea, like you just said of, mm-hmm. well, we, we need each other. 
And so there's a range of gifts that make up the body of Christ. And so it's not the, yeah, so the gift is attached to a person. And so therefore you need the person within the community. I love this. I don't know. That's so good. Hmm. Sorry, that was just some verbal process. No, that was perfect. <laughs> it's reminding me of First Peter 4. If, if it's okay, I just want to read this passage. Please. So this is coming to us from our homeboy, the Apostle Peter. Um, a man who operated in incredible gifts himself. Uh, for example, I just wanted to throw this in there. Acts chapter 5 Um, He and others are in Solomon's colonnade at the temple. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Crowds gathered um, from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. That's incredible. Yeah. Actually, only a handful of passages, even in Jesus's ministry, do we see those words. All of them were healed. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, even in Jesus's ministry, often it says many of them, and then Jesus withdrew into the mountains to pray. Yeah. Um, so incredible stuff is happening in the church. Uh, it threw Peter even bump up the verse right before that verse 15. It says that, um, people brought the sick into the streets of Jerusalem and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by, which it doesn't explicitly say this, but I'm going to assume what that means is that Peter's shadow healed people. Yeah. Doesn't that, that's what that sounds like. That's what it sounds like. And I've heard people preach that. That's where that comes from. So say, say you got this dude that the Lord said upon this rock, I will build the church. Incredible giftings in the Lord. Yeah. His shadow is healing people as he's walking by them. Now, this man has an opportunity to write two letters to the church that are saved in the canon of scripture for the rest of time. (laughs) What is he going to utilize those precious words? Um, Like what kinds of words is he going to utilize in order to make the most important points that he's going to make? Yeah. Is he going to spend as many chapters as he can talking about how to cultivate the gift of healing? Hmm. How to practice prophecy? This, to me, honestly, it was a little bit of a box breaker, but I think it's helpful to see while he mentions the gifts in this passage I'm about to bring up, I think this might be the only part in his two letters where he even mentions the things like healing and prophecy. Yeah. Um, otherwise, he's talking about building character unto Christ-likeness, how to endure suffering. Hmm. It's encouragement that he's writing. Hmm. Okay, so let me read. This is 1 Peter chapter 4, starting at verse 7, going through 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. The importance of prayer. Mm -hmm. Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Okay, honestly, we're getting a lot here that we could unpack. That's like the great commandment, love each other deeply. Because it covers a multitude of sins. There's a reference to the pure life, the moral, excellent life away from sinfulness. Offer hospitality. So like live life with one another with open arms, open houses without grumbling. Don't gossip. Don't slander one another. Don't complain about each other. Have hospitable hearts. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Mm. That says a bunch of the things that we just yeah. said earlier, right? Mm-hmm. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received. So whatever God has chosen to give yeah. you, whatever that might be, it might be different than what your neighbor got. It might be different than everybody else in your church, but whatever gift you have received, use them to serve others. Because the way that God has blessed you is not for your sake, but it's for the sake of those that you might serve. Mm -hmm. As faithful stewards of God's grace 
in its various forms. There's stewards, stewardship, the parable of the talents. Yeah. That, that theme is woven throughout all of scripture. Focusing on what you have, have yeah. been given in your hands and not what you don't have. And like, let that just be your soul. Amen. Even stewardship of like, I want to take whatever gift I have and make it the best possible. Ah, that's good. So studying scripture about it, pra- obviously, I mean, practicing it is the biggest thing. Amen. Putting it to use. Yeah. If it's, yeah, if it's whatever, hospitality, if it's faith, if it's um, prayer, intercession, yeah. you know, like, yeah, do that, like become a master of that and let it become a master of you kind of a thing. Because the church needs it. Mm-hmm. God gave you that yeah. gift because the church needs it. Yeah. I'll keep reading just a little bit more. Please do. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. And I don't think that's just speaking of prophecy. I think that's talking about just talking in general. Mm -hmm. Whatever comes out of our tongue, may it be like the words of God, honoring, encouraging, upbuilding, so on. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Notice in all of this, there's not some kind of a divide. This is another cultural thing that we have to do. There's not a divide between the things of Christianity that are spiritual and then the, just the natural things of Christianity, Yes, you know, like, oh, my labor against sin. That's just kind of like a natural thing. That's my willpower. I'm trying to like read atomic habits because James clear is my discipler and he's going to teach me how to like, you know, get out of bad sin habits Mm -hmm. and build a healthy life of discipleship. That's a natural thing. But if I'm speaking in tongues, who, or if there's healing, if like, who knows? If there's gold dust in the room, like that's the supernatural stuff. That's where Mm -hmm. God is involved. But God's not involved when I'm like trying to just remain peaceful in traffic. Yeah. (laughs) You know how we have a tendency to divide those things? Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. That divorce is unbiblical. And I just want to call that that way um, because it's a cultural thing that is the soup that we swim in. And we need in every way possible to disciple our minds to remember that we as image bearers of God, renewed by the blood of Christ, with the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us and filling us to the brim with his goodness, has made us his living temple on earth today. Mm. God is incarnate in the world in us, his church. Mm. That right there is the most supernatural thing. God is sustaining our very existence by his love and life. Mm, So good. Nature is not something that he stepped away from. That's an enlightenment idea. So we need to reclaim this concept that in fact, everything is spiritual Mm. and you see it in scripture all over the place. Like right here, you should serve with the strength that God provides any strength that you have inside of you. It's not because of you. It's because of God in you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think if we do a good job of remembering that everything is spiritual, then you'll remember that tongues isn't something that's just super special because it's my only opportunity to encounter God. No, when you practice joy, when life is hard, that's encountering Mm. the presence of God in your life. Yeah. Oh, for sure. That's leaning into one of the fruit of the spirit. I think that's where, where I want to shine the spotlight for most of the rest of this conversation is that we, we have a tendency to hyper fixate in the charismatic church on the gifts of the Holy spirit. Um, not intentionally, I don't think, but to the detriment of our practice of the fruit of the Holy spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on, say that. I think we assume that too often, at least I, I'll just confess it too often. I passively take the back seat thinking if I pursue a really meaningful worship moment on a Sunday and I get super emotional, I'm praying in tongues, I'm connected to God in that space. Then the fruit of the spirit will just come out of me. Hmm. And what's tricky about that is that that is like half true. Yeah. Galatians five 
calls them the fruit of the spirit, not the fruit of your work. So it is God. Yeah. But in Galatians five, right after the list of the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Self-control. You crushed it. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. I never learned the song. I didn't ever knew. I don't think I know a song either. Oh really? Yeah. I know some, maybe it's our youth that oh, know okay. a song. I know a song of the books of the Bible. Oh, I don't like know a that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, right after it, it says, I'll just read it. Yeah. It's always better when you read it. Basically keep in step with the spirit. Like yeah. there's, there's a simultaneous power of God in you and agency that you retain. And you have to choose to partner with God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And this is it right here. Verse 25. If we live by the spirit, let us also walk by the spirit. Let us not become boastful challenging one another, envying one another. Hmm. So he doesn't say, take a passive back seat to the spirit's work inside your spirit. You know, he says like, walk in it, get up and do it with the spirit. Mm -hmm. The picture that I like that has helped me with this is the, the idea of gardening because it's the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. So if fruit is coming, I'm not the energy that's creating fruit out of trees. I've oh. never, never done that. Yeah. Have you? I haven't. No, no I've tried, but it didn't work. <laughs> but I have pulled weeds. Mm-hmm. I have watered gardens before. I used to work on an organic farm. Yeah. So there was harvest. There was pulling weeds. There was planting. There was watering. Pruning. Pruning. For sure. Mm-hmm. To whatever those metaphors mean in your spiritual practices, do those. <laughs> and the Holy that's Spirit so will be good. will be faithful to grow the fruit. Yeah. Wow. That's a, such a good analogy. Man, I love that. Hmm. Yeah. I think, honestly, I think that's why Paul uses the word fruit of the Holy Spirit, because that has been biblically the picture of this simultaneous partnership of God and humans to have his will done on earth, even in our own character. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I've been talking a lot. You can tell I'm passionate. I love it. I'm just enjoying it. It's all good. (sighs) Praise God. So yeah, I mean, read the book of James and see how, like if all you're doing is earnestly seeking the gifts of the Holy spirit, see how James is interacting with, the path of discipleship Mm -hmm. or John in first John, you know, he's like, you tell me that you love the Lord. Great. Do you love your neighbor? Any of you who hates your brother, but says you love God is a liar Hmm. because you can't hate your neighbor and love God. Yeah. I don't think we audit ourselves with questions like that often enough. Totally. Yeah. You know, like, like, is there health in your internal family structure? My guess is it's probably messy because humans are messy. Mm -hmm. Have you worked diligently by the grace of God to work on that? Mm -hmm. To like, to find peace with those that you've had trouble finding peace with. If not, but you've been slain in the spirit every Sunday for the past year, then what's the fruit of being slain? Yeah. Jesus is not talking about the person who is slain the most. They're the one that will enter the kingdom of God. Totally. You know, he says, when you were out there and you saw me when I was hungry, you fed me. You saw me when I was naked, you clothed me. And they're like, Lord, when, when did we do that? He says, what you've done to the least of these, my brother, so you've done to me. Mm. That's character development. Yeah. That's generosity stewardship stewardship and i'm just telling you as much as we focus on the gifts which we should to some degree yeah it says earnestly seek the gifts that's also in scripture hallelujah yeah and i I, i'll be honest 
I'm earnestly seeking the gift of healing and I'm like praying for people to be healed. Yeah. And I've seen a handful of things that feel like miraculous healings that, that no, in faith, I'm going to say that are miraculous healings mm -hmm. and I praise God Yeah. <laughs> and I'm seeking that gift more all the time. Mm -hmm. So like, don't hear what I'm not saying. Yeah, of course. And the New Testament, the words of Jesus, the apostles are way more highlighting character development by the grace of God, mm -hmm. because the Holy Spirit is inside you, trying to work you into the image of Christ. This is so good. If I don't have my eyes on that, then I am missing it. Mm -hmm. That's why Paul says, 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak with all the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, then I'm just a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Yeah. Which isn't him saying it's just gibberish because it's all the tongues of men and of angels, mm -hmm. but your heart's not in the right place. Then those words don't mean what they could. It's just noise. Mm. <sighs> that puts the fear God in me a little bit. I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Uh, Work good. out your salvation with fear and trembling. Oh yeah. <laughs> I did write that one down. Philippians 2. Is that what we decided? Yes. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Mm. You see <laughs> the same tension right there. Yeah. It's God who works in you, but he just commanded them, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And you're like, wait, what? I'm like, wait, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. And mm -hmm. he says, yes. And amen, my friends <laughs> Yeah. and work it out mm -hmm. with fear and trembling. Like what? I'm supposed to have so much reverence for the glory and goodness of God that my life looks like it. And yeah. if it doesn't, then work on it. You know, I love that so <laughs> many of these truths are held in tension, which is I think a theme of even our discipleship with, with Jordan Verner as our pastor, he's like really highlighted this, mm -hmm. but when you have to hold these things in tension and you can't just, um, you know, write everything out in black and white, it just takes a continual work to like, Oh wow. Look, it says, um, you know, pursue the gifts earnestly here. And you're like, get in the gift zone. But then you're like, Oh yeah, I forgot <laughs> about the character thing. And then it's like, Oh, then I forgot about the gifts. And it's like, it's, <laughs> it makes you a much more whole person. Um. And, I believe makes you need each other too. I love that. Which is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. God's so good. He's really smart. He's way smarter than <laughs> any of the rest of us, isn't he? Oh, <laughs> so good. It's a good word to use when describing God. <laughs> it just God feels kind of silly. I know. It does feel silly because it's like, I don't know. Why is that? Why does that feel silly? Because obviously he's smart. He's <laughs> the most brilliant mind. <laughs> yeah, smart doesn't is doesn't feel like the smartest word for smart. Yeah, it's you know? like calling Jesus nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just the most loving being in all of existence. He was, <laughs> is love. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> praise um, the Lord. Yeah. Do you feel so, like there's anything else that you want to uh, share? Get off your chest. I was also going to read second Peter one, but I mean, honestly, first Peter four kind of, kind of said it. Um, yeah. I mean, I had a handful of things I was going to say. We could look to Jesus. Jesus is obviously healing people and casting out demons. Supernatural ministry is all over Jesus's ministry. Yeah. And in his words of discipleship, he says in the sermon on the Mount, you know, if salt has lost its saltiness, what is it good for? Mm -hmm. You're the light of the world. That's, that's character stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, who are you to judge your brother about the splinter in his eye when you have a plank in your own? First take the plank out and then you can judge your brother by that splinter. Mm. Just think about our good Jesus. Yeah. He says, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I say, don't lust after anyone. Cause when you've done that in your heart, you have committed adultery. Wow. Hmm. You've heard it said, don't murder, but man, I see you being all angry up at people over here. <laughs> That's murder in your heart. You be hating. You be hating. Yeah. That's murder in your heart. Hmm. Take it serious. Yeah. Jesus is saying. Yeah. 
check your heart. Like I want to be discipled by words that are that cutting. And I want to lean in to Jesus's words as much as I possibly can with all zeal yeah. where he says greater things than these you will see mm-hmm. in John chapter 14, 14, 12. Oh, tight. Did I write it down? Yeah, you're, you're on top of it. Lit. Yeah. <laughs> Greater things. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? It's at, it's at least the same that Jesus did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, by definition, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, man. That's so good. So, yeah. If you felt pulled in any kind of direction, then I pray that that was the Holy Spirit pulling you and not, you know, any of our silly folly because we're obviously not perfect. But um, we just wanted to wrestle through some of this messy conversation um, in pursuit of maybe this is the final point I want to make the upward call of God. Um I think this is another thing that is a trap that I fall into often. Mm-hmm. And I see the people that I'm discipling fall into it as well. There's this kind of light switch form of discipleship binary. Yeah. Am I on or am I off? Am I sinful or am I pure? Mm-hmm. Um, am I baptized in the Holy spirit or am I not? Do mm-hmm. I speak in tongues or do I not? Or is this like you got it or you don't. And then you don't have it. You're looking at everybody who does have it there's insecurity, there's comparison, there's resentment and frustration, and it's tearing the body apart. Mm -hmm. Heaven forbid. Yeah. I don't want to look at discipleship like that. Paul says in second Corinthians three, that we with unveiled face Mm -hmm. behold the glory of God and are being brought from one degree of glory to the next. There is no height or depth or length or width of God's glory that we will ever reach the end of. Come on. If our discipleship to Jesus just looks like we say the prayer of salvation, Jesus, I welcome you into my heart. And then we just coast for the rest of our lives. Hmm. I'm not in pursuit of following Jesus. I'm not trying to become like Jesus. (laughs) I'm, I just got fire insurance. Yeah. You know, I just gave my life to him and now I am content. That's not at all what the Bible is talking about. That feels so incomplete to what <laughs> Jesus is saying. It's just empty, isn't it? Well, cause I think Jesus command at the end of it all is to go make disciples. Yeah. I Amen. mean, it's not, it's not even to accept me into your heart. You know, right, right. <laughs> like, That's very new language. Yeah, it's go make disciples. Like this mm. isn't like it takes a lot to make a disciple. Yeah, and I think you'll find if you go start making disciples without doing some inner work, you'll be pretty disappointed in the fruit of your discipleship. And so then it's like, okay, then I gotta like take care of myself and or not take care of myself, like pursue wholeness through the Holy Spirit's mm. working inside of us. Amen. That's it, which isn't a binary. It's not a light switch spirituality. Totally. Yeah. Like I don't have it or I do. It's a, it's a progression into the more of God, Mm -hmm. which I think is what, what Paul is saying when he says in Philippians chapter three, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm increasing in Christ likeness. I'm becoming more like him. I'm not going to be content. Even if like, like what say somebody doesn't have a gift that they've been earnestly praying for. And then they receive it. Like what is the rest of their life? A discipleship going to look like, can you coast at that point? And like, don't hear what I'm not saying. I don't want to be legalistic. I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be the kind of Christian that says, you need to prove yourself to God. You need to earn his love. You need to earn your salvation. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is speaking for myself, I want to pursue more and more 
of the person that God created me to be and that Christ has called me to be. And that will be a lifelong journey of pursuit of the upward call of God. Mm -hmm. That won't be like, I've got it. Now let me just hold on to it as long as I can, but never like proceed into more Christ likeness because I have attained it. No, I I think this side of heaven, we will never attain it. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm running Hmm. and I'm running this race with endurance with my eyes fixed on Jesus the author and perfecter of my faith. Interesting. Again, there notice the work of God and my work happening in the same mix. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's an upward call. So whether it comes to your relationship with tongues, your relationship with prophecy, another spiritual gift, your relationship with the fruit of the spirit, say you're just not a very patient person and you know that about yourself. Don't just settle. Yeah. Don't this coast. Is, this is how I am. Yeah. Uh, I just, for me, I don't know. This is a petty example, but I would regularly tell people that I'm bad with names. And then that just becomes like a cop out to not learn people's names. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So good. And then there was a day when I was like, screw that. I'm not bad with names. I'm going to become good with names. Mm-hmm. And I still struggle at times, yeah. but I'm getting better because people's names matter because people matter. Absolutely. Uh, you see how you could click into one of those apathetic moments when you just accept. Yeah. Yeah. So, so don't just accept, uh, you don't have the gift of tongues, pursue it. But I would say pursue first prophecy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and don't pursue the gift of tongues without interpretation. And make sure you're not pursuing any of this stuff if you're not first pursuing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Yeah. That you might love the Lord your God with all of yourself and that you would love your neighbor as yourself. If you're not in pursuit of that in every facet of your being, then you're not discipling your life after Jesus. Yeah. I think this is going to be a convicting message. I hope that's not too hard. No. I'm just fired up about the it's, upward call right now in my life. It's so good. So I'm just giving you what I'm getting lately. <laughs> it's almost like discipleship. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, I could keep going. I've gone way too much, but this is good. I hit the notes. Feeling groovy. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And just just like read the scriptures and ask yourself these questions. Like James does it for me every time. He's like true religion, visiting the orphans and caring for the widows. (laughs) Yeah. That does something to the spiritual person. That's like really good at writing their newsletter and their email with Bible verses and stuff, but like, isn't out there doing it. Yeah. Man, it's all over the New Testament. So yeah, hopefully any conviction that you might feel is not from us as much as it is from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we don't want there to be any, yeah, like a a heaviness, a legalistic heaviness over this. That's not the goal of Christ. That's not the goal of this podcast. Amen. Yeah, no guilt, no shame. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No need to be perfect. Oh, yeah. Because you're perfectly loved in who you are right now. Yeah, that's good. All these paradoxes. It's a lot of tension. Oh, yeah. It's totally. a lot of mess. I'm like, it is a lot of mess. Wow. Like, that was that was messy. I'm glad to get to do this mess with you, Jace. <sighs> Praise the Lord. Mm. I completely agree. Wow. And we're glad to get to do it with you, friends, listeners. Bo, I-, I hope you crushed all of your workout today. If you're counting right now, 17. 21, four, six. <laughs> You're just trying to mess up his reps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Please email us at deepwaters at riverhouseministries.com if that works. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, shalom, friends. I think for now, we've we've done it with this conversation. Yeah. You feel good? Yes. All right. So that means that... Y'all have homework to give us 
uh, ideas of what you want us to talk about next. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, then we'll just go on to something else. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We've got many things to talk about. We do. But it's always nice to hear from you guys. It is. And I'm like, I think this was, this laid out a lot of messy, different opinions and stuff. If there's something you're wrestling through and even just want to talk to one of us about it, or we can Mm. point you to someone that is probably even more versed than us. Yeah. Please reach out. Grab us at church. I'll buy you coffee. I'll let Benji buy you coffee. (laughs) I'll buy the coffee that you drink while you meet with Jace. Oh, wow. <laughs> Abundance. That's so kind. I'll let Benji do that. All right. <laughs> mm, well, thanks, friends. Until next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye. We love you. Shalom. Bye. Don't go. Shalom. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Deep Waters podcast. If you have comments, questions, or concerns, maybe even a recipe or two, please send them to deepwaters at riverhouseministries.com. And if you would like to join us at Riverhouse for Sunday service, we meet at the Vineyard Boise at 4 p.m. We'd love to see you there. We could not do this podcast without a little help from our friends. Our theme music was written and recorded by the Riverhouse worship team. Production is done by Jordan Sodeman. Special thanks to Isaiah Guerrero for our artwork. Benjamin Olson writes and co-hosts with me, Jace Langley, and I also edit this bad boy. If you like this podcast and want to keep going on this journey of discipleship with us, please leave us a review wherever you listen to the Deep Waters podcast. May Christ be with you wherever you go.